Well, someday all the campaigns of this life will be finished. <clears throat> and thankfully, the victory has been won through Jesus, our Lord, and his work on the cross. Have you um, seen enough political ads yet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I've been watching them too. And it's amazing how this ad or this ad can be talking about the same person, but they're totally different in what they're saying about the same person. I know that those ads are all true because I've watched them and I have not seen any pants on fire yet. So I know they've got to be telling us the truth. Well, what do you expect from uh, candidates? We've been going through our, um, our fellowship of churches has some resolutions that we put forth every year. And I've been running through some of them with you. And uh, today we're going to take a look at another one uh, that has to do with some of our politicians and, and how they conduct themselves. Um, and I'll read that to you in a little bit. I think you'll be able to get some copies of it when this is over. Um, but in order to know what we should expect from a candidate, perhaps we need to know a little bit about the responsibilities that they have uh, as a government. And there's no place better to go and see where's the responsibilities and the authorities that a government has than to turn to Scripture. So I'm going to invite you to turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, and, verse, uh, and we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 2, I'm sorry. And, uh, and Hannah, I know it's not your fault, but I'm not getting crossed over there yet. So thank you. <laughs> so let's see if that does it for me. Mm, not yet either. There we go. Okay, 1 Peter 2. I'm going to read to you from verses 9 on through to about verse 17 or so. We could start earlier. We could go further, but I want to stay in some context here. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world, to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that, though they accuse you of doing wrong, that they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves, for the Lord's sake, to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors, who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God and honor the king. Oh, there's a lot there. First of all, starts off by telling us that as believers and followers in Jesus Christ, we are unique. We are a chosen people. We are to be distinct and different from the outside world, those who do not follow or know Jesus Christ. There's a unique relationship. It calls us a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people belonging to God. There should be a difference in your life and my life that other people can discern and, and see something there. In verses 11 and 12, it tells us about our testimony, how that should be. Uh, as we live among them, we should not be surrendering to those sinful desires, those things that would pull us away from spiritual life. But we should actually be living lives that are are so good, so gentle, so peaceful, so gracious, that those who would want to accuse us would not be able to because they can't find anything there to do. We have testimonies with purpose that we should be able to be a light in the darkness and, and bring hope 
to those who are outside of Christ. Then he goes into the responsibilities of the government and what they need to be doing. Um, it tells us we should be living lives of humility, that we should submit to the government and that we should place ourselves under them as much as possible. And those responsibilities that they have would be, first of all, to punish those who do wrong. That's what our government's supposed to do. They're supposed to protect those who are innocent and punish those who are wrong. And they commend those who do the right things. That's what a government does. It brings um, a lot of safety. It brings a lot of encouragement. Now, we could probably be very um, critical and say, is that really what our government does? And depending on where you look at, you could probably say no, but you could say yes to some, some parts of it, that uh, there are some good things that go on. It should result for us uh, and our actions that it brings a silencing to our opponents. Those who, uh, who look at us and say, you know, I see nothing but good in your life. I see consistency. I see integrity. I see spiritual life there. Uh, it's hard to bring an accusation against someone like that. But then it also tells us in verse 17, first of all, that we are to show respect to everyone, to everyone. That we're supposed to um, respect and, and treat well people who are outsiders. And that would be the outsiders outside the household of faith. Those who are pagan, those who are unsaved. Uh, we're supposed to have a respectful relationship with them. But it goes on to say that we should have a love for the brotherhood of believers. Now, Jesus mentioned also something like that, didn't he, when he said that uh, the world is going to see a distinction in us because of the way that we love one another. Uh, some of you know this one, but um, old, old time ago, uh, there used to be a poem that people would quote that said something about, um, oh, to be up above with those we love, that would be such glory but to dwell below with those we know, now that's a different story. <laughs> um, and that's kind of the way it is. We, you know, we as believers say, oh, someday we're gonna be in glory with Christ and, and heaven, and we like to paint the picture that scripture does, and it's gonna be wonderful, but yet sometimes within the body of Christ, we don't treat each other well, and we don't respect each other, and we don't show love toward each other, and that's sinful, that's wrong. Uh, it's probably the most basic commandment by Christ is that we are to love within the household of faith each other. Um, are there differences? Of course there's differences. We're always going to have a different... He's not asking for uniformity. He's asking for unity in the body of Christ, that we seek the same thing. We seek the glory of God. And that we do that by honoring him as much as we can and serving him and lifting up each other. But we can look at things different. Some people like blue and some people like red, and that's okay. Or, you know, some like big and some like small. Or some like salt and some like sugar, whatever. Um, it's okay to be different, but we need to show love toward each other. And then it says to honor the authorities. Sometimes that's hard because we don't always agree with the authorities. And it's a very difficult thing to, to follow and practice. But Christians are to be law-abiding citizens. That's something that we are required to do. Doesn't mean we have to agree with every law, but we need to uh, abide by those laws. If the law violates the revealed will of God, we know that God is against this, then we should choose to obey God instead of that law. But also recognize that just because God, we think we're on God's side and God is on our side when we do that, we still will have to face the penalties of that particular law. We don't get that a lot in our culture today. Other countries do. Uh, and it is widespread in 
that um, there's a lot of persecution going on. We'll talk about that in just a little bit, but uh, it, it comes our way a little bit more every year and things are, uh, are not as wonderful as they used to be uh, many decades ago. There's other passages that I think are interesting to the discussion of what God expects from our government, what we should expect from our candidates. I'm not going to have you look up all these. You can look at them later. But in Romans chapter 13, that's pretty much a classic section, especially those four or five verses at the beginning. It says that God's servant, which is the government person that God sets up, is there to do good. And as long as we are doing what's right and, and, and we're doing all the right things, government will treat us well. Because government has been given authority by God to be, as it says in Romans 13, an agent of wrath. God's given the state the power of life and death. And the reason why they have that power is in order to maintain um, civility and good order in our culture. There's um, a passage that I think is interesting because of who wrote it. King Solomon wrote this, and he says, Fear the Lord and the king, my son, and do not join with the rebellious. I've been trying to figure out which son was he thinking about because some of his sons joined the rebellion. Do not join with the rebellious, for those two, and the two would be the Lord and the king, those two will send sudden destruction upon them. And who knows what calamities they can bring. So King Solomon's saying to, I think, all of his listeners, but specifically his sons should take this to heart. Don't, you know, you better fear God and fear the authority because if you join that rebellious group and you just go against it, those two have the authority and the power to bring sudden destruction and they can bring incredible calamities upon us. In another book in the scriptures in Daniel, uh, on a day when he was going to reveal uh, a vision that, that the king had been having, made this statement, praise be to the name of God forever and ever. That's actually the way it's written. Spell check doesn't like that, wants to combine those words. But uh, wisdom and power are his. Here's what it says. He changes the times and seasons. Anybody who's been outside lately, it's changing, isn't it? Whose fault is that? That's God. It's not Dick Goddard. It's God that does that. God does that for us, and, um, and mostly we think that's beautiful and wonderful. But he also sets up kings and disposes of them. By the way, you can substitute the word presidents or prime ministers or governors or mayors or, or council people or whatever you want to put in there. God is the one who sets up and governs all that, and he brings them in and he brings them out. From God's perspective, these people come and go. They're interchangeable parts. Um, it's not forever for them, but God is. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. And I remember that in James chapter 1, it tells us that if you lack for wisdom, all you need to do is to humbly come to God and ask, and he doesn't mess with you, he doesn't embarrass you, he doesn't hurt you, but he wants to give you wisdom liberally. <clears throat> An interesting situation was when Jesus was before the, um, the trial with Pilate, and Pilate uh, asked some questions and didn't get what he wanted from Jesus. And he basically said, do you know who you're messing with? I have the authority to do whatever. I could put you to death if I want to. And Jesus answered and said, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. Pilate, you don't have any, you think you are top dog you know nothing if god wants to strike you down right now he can do that in a moment's notice hmm. those different powers are all given by god around our world there's just a lot of um, a lot of difficult things to understand and and to see what's going on um, 
We talked about a few weeks ago uh, those who are being persecuted for their faith in Christ. And that just gets stronger and more and more every day. And it goes on. Uh, I have a couple quotes here. There was a, a, a lady in Iraq, a Christian woman, who said, We have lost all of our possessions, but we still have our faith in Jesus. Wow. Would you be able to do that? I mean, if someone came in and violently ripped you away from your family and, and hurt you physically and destroyed all your stuff, would you be able to say, oh, well, but at least I still got Jesus? That's a pretty tough situation to be in. In Syria, someone said that we are in danger. Our family is in danger, but we serve a mighty God. We serve a mighty We sang a little bit earlier about um, Jehovah God being our guide and helping us. And we, we sang also a chorus about waiting on the Lord and, and strength coming up. That, that was taken from Isaiah, that passage about the, the chorus about waiting on the Lord. And in, in Isaiah 40, where it talks about waiting on the Lord and he'll renew our strength, uh, that sounds so hard for us. We hate to wait. We hate to wait at doctor's offices. I hate to wait at stop signs. We hate to wait at anything. We don't like to do that. We're always in a hurry. But that word wait in the Hebrew means to stop striving, stop fighting against. And it's actually a very active word. We think the word wait means, okay, sit there and do nothing. But it actually means that we need to be striving and working hard toward waiting on God. We're doing stuff. We're looking for him. We're, we're trying really hard for him to do stuff. I was looking at an article in, the, in a magazine the other day about, uh, I, it caught my eye. There's a little three-year-old Nigerian boy. His name happened to be Joel. And uh, it caught my eye because he had all this really bad scabbing and scarring on his head and his face. And I just felt so sorry. And I thought, oh, this kid was born with a disease or something. No, the story told that little Joel, three years old, had been given a Bible from his parents. It was a children's Bible that he could look at and see stories and stuff. And he was walking toward his home from in his village in northeast Nigeria. And a band of the, um, uh, of the Islamic group that's there, that's the same group that kidnapped those couple hundred schoolgirls, they saw him and they stole his Bible from him, and they threw it into the fire. And he went over and got a stick and tried to fish it out, and they pushed his face into the Bible that was in the fire and held their foot on his head while they you know, said things to him about being an infidel and he should die. And the kid apparently passed out, and they left him for dead, but he survived. And this is what people are going through around the world facing very, very difficult times because of their faith in Jesus Christ. I'm not suggesting that we're on the verge of that today, but I am saying that it's very, very critical that we know where we're heading as a culture, what's going on as far as our politicians. Um, it's very important. Here's the resolution that we have written. This is really around the subject of responsible government fiscal policies. Wouldn't, that almost seems oxymoron, doesn't it? Re, responsible government policies, fiscal? You gotta be kidding me. But this is what we've sent out and, and elected leaders uh, of all levels have received copies of this um, in the past. It, it quotes Proverbs 22, seven when it says, the borrower, the borrower is servant to the lender. And then it just goes on to express our concern about the high deficit. And then in the second paragraph, it reminds the government that um, all governments, including our very own governments, that um, they need to have a better attitude toward debt and inflation and uh, that they need to line up in harmony with biblical responsibility regarding integrity and, and the importance of, of stewardship. And the last paragraph says, we call on our nation's leaders to lead with responsible integrity and to protect the heritage of our children and the assets of its citizens 
by acting responsibly with respect to the federal deficit, the federal debt, and federal money creation. So um, that one really does address finances a lot. In the year 1801, Thomas Jefferson was going to be uh, installed as the President of the United States. It was his first inauguration. And he made this comment about our need for a wise and frugal government, which shall restrain men from injuring one another, shall leave them otherwise free to re regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement, and shall not take from the mouth of labor the bread it has earned. That sounds pretty reasonable to me. The government's there to protect us and, and our assets, our possessions, our finances, and as long as we're using them properly and, uh, and it should not take that. I'm gonna show you, uh, this is an outline that one of our pastors in California, Don Shoemaker, heads up our social concerns. And he sent this to me because he told me he just spoke on this recently. I had told him what I was doing. And he said, here, use this. So I'm using this. Um, here's his outline for uh, what he calls seven qualities <clears throat> that um, those seeking office should have. Um, if you want to be elected, this is what you should do. Frugality. And that has to do with just being very, very careful with people's um, money and realize that every tax dollar takes money from people, not from impersonal things. That you know, our, our elected officials should understand that. It's not their money. They shouldn't be um, spending it carelessly. Accountability is another area. Recognizing that managing these funds uh, is a special privilege and a power and a trust given to them but they need to make themselves accountable um, to their constituents because also whether they recognize it or not, they are accountable to God. And yet um, you and I have the ability to bring them into accountability as time goes on. Integrity, they need to be people of truthfulness, fairness, good character. If you, read, if you watch the ads, you're not seeing that. <laughs> You're not seeing um, always truthfulness. Each one says, well, the other guy's ad was not right. This one's right. And uh, it's certainly not good character when you're pulling apart other people who are just as good slash as bad as you are. So um, collegiality, <clears throat> this has to do with the ability to working with other people, even those with opposing viewpoints. Um, it's really important for them to function that way. You can't separate into two groups that just shoot cannons at each other all the time. You need to be able to work with each other and, and that process is very, very important to get things done the right way. Efficiency, uh, trying to get the best bang out of your buck that you can get, making sure that uh, you are doing things that are uh, fair and streamlined. That means everything comes into question. Jefferson said uh, he called for a suppression of unnecessary offices, of useless establishments and, and expenses. They need to think through all that. That comes under the next thing too, productivity. Sometimes you, as a good leader, you have to look at a program and say, yeah, I know this has been in existence, but is it really, really needed today? Is it doing what it was established to do? Is there a need for it anymore? So they need to really look at hard facts and, and understand what is uh, good for the people and what works out well today. And then the last one is accessibility, being open to those who serve. I'm not sure you want to do it to the extreme that Abe Lincoln did, where he just had an open door at the White House and people formed lines and they came in on some days and they could sit and talk to him. and tell him whatever they wanted to do, and he tried to get it done. Uh, Moses learned a long time ago that that's not a healthy thing to do for a leader of such a large number of people. But you do need to be accessible. You need to be able to help them uh, to find what they need to find and to take care of their needs. <clears throat> 
voting takes a lot of work. Um, political platforms today are very pronounced. One party is totally different than the other party, but that doesn't mean that everybody is in harmony with that. I know there are politicians up for election this year that are certain parties, but they have policies themselves that don't coordinate with their party platform. And you need to investigate that. It takes a lot of work to do that. Uh, and most of us don't like that kind of work. But to be, to be able to, on Tuesday, function well, you need to be informed, you need to discern, you need to understand what God's expectations are, what your expectations are, and you probably should be praying a lot about it. Because these leaders are going to be selected for a couple years, some a little bit longer, and they're very, very important. In our culture, the most important issues today are not political issues, they are spiritual issues. And it's where we are going and, and how we are following or not following God and his word. Satan and our world uh, is doing a tremendous job of trying to sidetrack us from what God would have us to do. We find that um, just because we're Christians don't mean that we're going to defeat every negative thing out there. Satan doesn't tremble at the feet of Christians. He trembles at the feet of the cross of Jesus Christ. And we need to be sure, though, that we are promoting that cross and, and bringing that hope to people. Personal stewardship. You need to be living those seven qualities. It's one thing to demand that from our elected officials, but we should be living that. We should be walking those policies as well and asking them to do likewise. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father, how we thank you for your guidance that you give to us. And we do thank you for the opportunities that we have in this country to freely express our faith and our commitment to you and to be able to have the privilege of doing things like on Tuesday, electing uh, officials to rule and, and reign over us and with us. Lord, help us to be the, the Christian citizens that you want us to be, responsible and, and informed and also um, respecting and loving those that you have asked us to respect and love. Thank you for the privileges you give to us, the blessings that we so surely um, experience. We honor and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.